is the 63rd wedding anniversary for Bob and Donetta Johnson. Congratulations over here. 63 years. God bless you. Thank you for uh, setting a great example for all of us. All right, well, thanks for being here today. <clears throat> this is a beautiful day outside, second Sunday of November, and we are rolling along. We started this series last week. Uh, it's an early church history uh, segment to this series, Origin Stories. Sometimes I feel like our brand of church doesn't do a great job of talking about the leaders throughout church history who have allowed us to get and have the church that we have today. I'm not talking just about Gateway Church. Yesterday we had a funeral service for one of the charter members of Gateway Church, Helen Rose, and that Danny was here this morning, and we appreciate him being here. But I'm talking about the larger church. I'm talking about Christianity as we know it today. And so this series, <clears throat> you know, is, I don't want it to be a history lesson as much as I want it to be uh, a message to, first of all, to educate us. To educate us. We need to know these names. These aren't names that belong to other churches. Uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church really claims these people as their starters, but the, these guys belong to all of Christianity, not to any one brand of church or style of church. So I want to educate us a little bit about some of the things that happen after the period of what we call the apostolic age, the time when the apostles lived. And the last living apostle was the apostle John. He died somewhere, you know, just shy of 100, 100 A.D. or A.D. 100. What happened after that? <clears throat> well, that's kind of what we're talking about. Who are the men and women who, who towed the line of Christianity and lived out the faith? So I want to educate us, and I also wanted to remind us of the challenges that they faced throughout the centuries. The same challenges that they faced are some of the same challenges that we face today. Challenges, for instance, like this. How would you live your life without a copy of the Bible? What if you didn't have the Bible? <clears throat> what if you didn't have an app where you could go to and go to any verse or some kind of a reminder app, a scripture of the day? The people, especially in the second century, you know, it wasn't until late, late, maybe the third segment of this series that we're going to talk about this next year sometime, until every person could have access to the Bible anytime they wanted it. Before that time, only church leaders had them, and they were maybe chained to a, a, a post or a, a seat or a table in a church or in some dark place where people uh, could get access occasionally, and the ones that could get access are the ones that could read and, you know, most people couldn't read in the earliest centuries of this country, or the world, really. And um, <clears throat> so I want to I remind us of their challenges. What would it be like to live out your faith without, without the New Testament? Now, the New Testament was written, it just wasn't collected. It hadn't been gathered. Letters and Gospels were floating around, and maybe this church would have it for this period of time, and then uh, they might copy it down so they could keep a copy, and then they would pass it along. There's a place in the Bible where Paul says, read this letter, and then take it to the church at Laodicea and read that letter. Let them read the letter, and you get the letter from them. So they pass these letters along, and the people read them, or the people had them read by the church leaders. Today, we have their own copy. You probably have multiple copies. You could go to your house and probably find copies of the Bible. You can go just about anywhere and find the Bible in bookstores and, and, and hotels and any place. And it just wasn't like that. That was a challenge they had uh, to deal with in their, in their day. <clears throat> so what would that have been like? Also, what would it be like if, if by being a Christian, your Christianity, your faith was illegal or punishable by death. What would that be like? What would it be like to live in a time 
when saying I'm a Christian or I believe in Jesus is illegal and punishable by some sort of torture or uh, death. That'd be, that'd be a tough time to live in, wouldn't it? That's the time of the second century. Now, it wasn't always like that, but there have been throughout the centuries persecution of different kinds of Christians, and any Christian in the second century after, after the apostle John lived, and really before he died, it was punishable by death to be a Christian just because you were a Christian. If someone said, you know, today you can live or you can worship some other religion or some other God, what would you do? Well, I talked to someone uh, from last week's message from our Taze Valley campus who said, you know, I really believe the church, that Christians need to be ready for persecution in our day. Now, I don't know if it's going to come to this. I don't see it coming to be punishable by death or some kind of loss of limb or family member or something, but there's no doubt about it, Christianity, true Christianity, is at the very least being marginalized. Marginalized, that is pushed to the side. You know, that it's not normal anymore to be a Christian. You can be a Christian, and we're not going to bother you, but it's not normal. You're abnormal. You, if you believe in God and the creation, and that, uh, that, you know, that God had his hand in things, then uh, you're abnormal. You're not normal. Our high schools are teaching this, and our colleges are teaching this, that Christianity is one thing, but it's not the best thing, and it's just a, just a side thing. And if you, if you believe it, you're going to be persecuted in other ways. You're going to be ridiculed and mocked and made fun of and criticized for your old-fashioned beliefs. So we definitely know that is happening. Will worse things happen because we're Christians? Perhaps. Perhaps. And I think we do need to be ready Historians tell us that in the first three centuries of Christianity, including the one in which Christ lived, which would be the first century, and then the 100s, which would be the second century, and then part of the way through the 300s, which would be, you know, that'd be the, or the 200s, all the 200s, and then part of the way through the 300s, so you got the first, second, third, and a little bit of the fourth century, historians say that as as few as a few hundred thousand people were killed for their faith, and as many as two to three million people died because they said, I am a Christian. John, the old apostle, when he received the revelation on the Isle of Pat Patmos, he wrote a lot of things that were really happening at that time, and some of those things were, were to be happening in the future. And, and I think when they talked in Revelation 17 about the great prostitute Babylon, they're referring, most people believe they're referring, that he's referring to the, to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, you can read this and study this later, but if it is the Roman Empire, it would have been a veiled reference by calling the Roman Empire the great prostitute, Babylon. Most people think it is the Roman Empire. And here's what verse 6 says in Revelation 17. John said, I saw that the woman, which would be the Roman Empire, was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And so, you know, a very vivid image here, she was drunk on the blood of Christians. <clears throat> there was so much of it. The Romans were masters at torture and terror. They were good at it. I mean, we owe a lot to the Romans. I don't know if you know, but it's a part of our system of government you know, having a republic and having a congress and a senate and that kind of thing. We owe that to the, to the Romans. They were very smart in a lot of ways. A lot of you who are in the medical field, you, you can trace a lot of the, the medical terms back to Latin, which was the language of Rome. And you can see a lot of what we know today in medicine and in and sports. You know, the, the Greeks were the, the great Olympians, but it was the Romans really that it increased that and made it a sport for uh, spectating. And, you know, when they built their arena, arenas, the, the Greeks just liked to do the sport. The Romans liked to entertain themselves with sport. And so many things we owe to the Romans, but I want to tell you one thing the Romans were known for, and that was killing and torturing and terrorizing and conquering. And they knew how to wipe out people, they knew how to assimilate people, and they knew how to, to get rid of certain groups within their empire, and they tried to do this with Christianity. 
It really is miraculous that Christianity even survived past the first three or four centuries of its existence. It's miraculous. And we believe God had his hand in all of that. Christians were being burned and boiled and decapitated, and they were being cut limbs off, and they were being stabbed through any way that you could think of killing someone. The Romans killed Christians. Threw them to wild beasts and just watched them in glee and, and delight as the beasts would tear up the, the, uh, the, the poor Christian in the arena. They would maybe dip them in blood or something first or pour blood on them so the, the beasts would attack them uh, more viciously. It was a terrible way to die. And the Romans knew that if they could wipe out the leaders of this movement, they could possibly destroy the movement. Now, by by the time of the mid-second century, Christianity really had outgrown its, its Jewish identity. In the first century, Christianity was just a, a sect of Judaism. The leader was Jewish. <clears throat> Most of the first converts were Jewish. It started in Jerusalem. It was a Jewish sect. So the Jews and the Romans persecuted them. Nero first did it in, in his reign in about the 60s. That's when the apostle Peter and Paul were killed and thousands and hundreds of thousands of other Christians at Nero, he was deranged. But by the time of the second century, the 100s, Rome had picked up on this and said, this is no longer a Jewish sect. It, it is its own religion and it's growing and we need to wipe it out. And so the first thing they did is they went after the leaders. One such leader was a man by the name of Polycarp. You may have heard his name. Polycarp was born in A.D. 69, just after Peter and Paul were crucified or killed for their faith. A.D. 69, so he was late first century. Polycarp was generally uneducated. We don't really have any writings from Polycarp. A little bit of a letter to the Philippian church that he wrote when he sent some other documents to them. But he was uneducated, but he was a, a young boy in Smyrna, maybe you recognize the name Smyrna from the book of Revelation. One of the first seven letters was written to the church at Smyrna. And he had a spiritual leader. Anybody guess who his spiritual leader was? The apostle John. John took him under his wing and he trained him in the gospel. Perhaps it was a man like Polycarp of whom John was speaking in his third letter when he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And, and that child in 3 John 1, 4 could have been, you know, we don't, we don't know that John had any literal children or biological children. That child could have been uh, someone like Polycarp. Now, I don't know if you remember the book of Revelation or much about it, but in those first seven letters, a lot of things were prophetic as, the, as Jesus prophesied about what would happen in that particular church. And I want to show you what he said in uh, the letter to Smyrna. And this is the church that Polycarp grew up in, this church. Jesus said, don't be afraid of what you're about to what? Enjoy? Suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, I take this 10 days to be a figurative time period of, you know, this is going to happen for this amount of time. And we know it was longer than 10 days. It was years and years they suffered persecution. He said, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. <clears throat> So Polycarp grew up knowing that he was in a condition, in a state, in a religion that was going to suffer, and they were going to be tested. And so Polycarp, eventually growing up in this church, loving the Lord, loving the word as it got passed from church to church, loving the old apostle John. When John, before John died, most people believe that John brought Polycarp up in front of the church and said, here is your leader. Now John was from Ephesus, but also Smyrna and Ephesus are close in proximity. And so he had influence over several churches, but that he brought Polycarp up and said, here's your leader. And Polycarp became really the pastor of this church for many years. He was 86 years old when the Romans finally decided we got to get him. We got to get him. 
And so they began looking for Polycarp, and, and the history tells us that Polycarp was kind of running a little bit to hide. Now, you know, we can't blame him for that. We, you need to live as long as you can. I'm not saying go offer yourself up to be persecuted. But when they finally got to him after torturing two young, uh, two young boys... Polycarp had just left that house and went to another house. Polycarp saw the Romans coming and he said, I'm not running anymore. The Romans came, he invited them in. History tells us he served them tea and treated them cordially and, and, uh, and welcomed them in. And then they took him to the proconsul, 86 years old. <clears throat> and when, the, when the, the Roman guards who had come to love him and everybody that knew him loved him, he was the old pastor. He never did anything wrong. He was nice. He was kind. He just loved God and he loved his people. He, he was not a social dissident or, or anybody to, to really worry about, but he was a leader, and he was perpetuating Christianity. And so they didn't really have the heart to brutally kill him, or really, they, they wanted to make it easy for him. And so the proconsul said, look, if you'll just curse Christ, I'll release you. Polycarp said, and I have a series of quotes here from him, Polycarp said, 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul said, then just worship the emperor. You don't have to curse Christ. Just throw a little incense to the emperor, the idol to the emperor. He said, Polycarp, if you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you know, don't know who I am. I, he, hear it plainly, I am a Christian. The proconsul said, then I'm going to let the wild beasts come and get you. I love what Polycarp says here. He says, bring them on. You know, I see a little Clint Eastwood here, huh? Bring them on. I would change my mind if it meant going from the worst to the better, but not to change from the right to the wrong. The proconsul's patience is wearing thin, and he said that I'm going to burn you alive. Polycarp said, you threaten fire that burns for an hour and is gone, but the eternal fire of judgment on the wicked is forever. Wow, what a perspective. And they did. They lit him on fire. And history tells us that the fire didn't consume him, that it wouldn't kill him. And so they had to stab him. And history, I don't know if we can believe it all, says that the blood that came forth put out the fire. Wouldn't that be awesome? The guy who stood next to him, who was, uh, who was putting him to death, who was over the soldiers who were doing that, said, you know, when his flesh burned, it didn't smell like burnt flesh. It kind of smelled like baked bread. Before he died, Polycarp said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. What courageous faith. What incredible inspiration for us. We read in our focus time that passage from Revelation 12. Now have come the salvation, power, and kingdom of our God and the authority of the Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accused them before our God day and night has been hurled down. This is a vision of the future. And, and this line of martyrs that John saw... <clears throat> All these martyrs who are standing around the throne, who are these people? And, uh, they, and, the, and, the, and the angel says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and because they did not love their lives too much as to shrink from death. And I, I just wonder about 21st century Christians, at what point would we throw in the towel and say, you know, if it's going to cost me that job, I, I'll won't profess Christ. If it's going to cost me that raised, uh, I won't profess Christ. You know, if it's, going to, if it's going to hurt my family, if it's going to hurt my reputation, if, it, if it's going to cause me to lose something, then I, you know, I can give up Jesus for that. I can, I can give him up. If it means I can't stand in the circle with the guys and, and use filthy language and tell filthy jokes and, and be one of the guys, you know, if it means I can't do that, then I'll give him up. If it means I can't live the way I want to live, then I'll give him up. Listen to me, folks. The, the issue of your life, the issue of your life that you're going to stand in front of God one day and be accountable for is this issue. What did you believe about Jesus? 
You know, we just came off the Gospel of Mark that really was all about Jesus revealing himself to his apostles and to the world. And now we see that the issue, and, this, and listen to this, this is in your small group questions, the longest running debate, the longest running controversy in the early church, and even today, is this question, who really was Jesus? Now, Polycarp had a student. Uh, we, we talked about Justin, the apologist. We're going to f- skip to him. Justin, he was an apologist. He defended Christianity to the outsiders, those who weren't Christians, those who didn't believe the Bible. That was his job as an apologist. You know, tonight we're having our uh, meat lovers class, and we're into apologetics right now, and we're going to be talking about the historicity of Christianity. How can we trust the Bible? How do we know that God's Word is true? How, how, can we, how can we know historically that this was written when they said it was and that it's factual? So, so that's what Justin did. Polycarp was just an old pastor, a faithful pastor. He had a student whose name was Irenaeus. Say that name with me, Irenaeus. Now, ladies, if any of you uh, are going to have children or about to have a child, I would suggest this as a name. I like it, Irenaeus. I promise you nobody else will have it. Irenaeus studied under Polycarp, who studied under who? The Apostle John. Now, the life of Irenaeus takes us into the second century. He died somewhere around 202, 202, somewhere around there. Most people think he was martyred. He became a leader in the church of Lyon, which is in France, which tells us the gospel by the mid-second century has left Jerusalem, and now it's in the western part of the world, in France, in Europe. That tells us that they took the gospel mandate seriously to spread the gospel. Irenaeus knew Polycarp and went to France and eventually became a leader in, in the church in, in uh, Lyon. He became the leader, the pastor of that church. And uh, he, was, he was well known as a, not an apologist, but as a theologian. He was a theologian. That means that he didn't defend Christianity to the outside world. He talked to people who already believed the Bible, who said they already believed in Jesus. And his job was to correct them and to help them understand the Bible a little bit more. Now, he, he was big on this thing called apostolic succession. In other words, he had a controversy with someone, and he said, look, you have to believe me. you got to do what I say, because I was a student of Polycarp. And Polycarp was a student of who? John. And John spent time with who? Jesus. Now, there's, you know, the Roman Catholic Church today claims apostolic succession in the papacy or the, the see of Rome, that means the, the power seat, the religious power seat in Rome, the bishop of Rome, who is the pope. They claim apostolic succession, that they have a person who can trace themselves back to a guy who studied under a guy, who studied under another guy, who studied under a guy, all the way back to Peter, who spent time with Jesus. Now that's kind of a different line than Irenaeus. Irenaeus came through John, From Peter, it was Clement, and then goes on down to who they say today. Now, I don't believe that. That's why we're not Roman Catholic. That's one reason of many. Apostolic succession for Irenaeus was true. That had only been 150 years to Jesus. But to the modern Roman Catholic Church, I just can't buy that. We can't buy that. Now, I'm not here to diss their church. I'm just saying that there's one problem with this, if you're Roman Catholic or come from Roman Catholicism, is that apostolic succession gets a little bit tough to figure out when you get in those Middle Ages. It, it, be, it kind of waters down and goes away. But that's the, this is the authority. I studied under somebody who studied under somebody who was with Jesus. You have to listen to me. When I speak, I speak like Jesus is speaking. Now, if you wondered why the Pope can speak in what they call cathedra, which is official, or ex-cathedra, outside of the official, and when he speaks cathedra, it means you have to listen. This is like God's word. It's because of this thing called apostolic succession. They claim they can go all the way back to Jesus through the see of Rome, which is the papacy or the Roman bishop. Well, I'm not here to argue with him about that, but I'm going to tell you they can't. Irenaeus could, 
go back to John to Jesus, but, but they can't. But that's where they get the Pope being able to speak, and it's like God's word. It's God's word. Now, we're not Roman Catholic. We're Protestants. We're evangelical Christians. And uh, we don't believe that uh, apostolic succession even exists today because it's too far gone. We don't need it because we have the word of God compiled for us. So Irenaeus, he used this book he wrote called Against Heresies to fight against these people known as Gnostics. Gnostics believe that God is good, but material things or flesh or creation is bad. By the way, Islam believes this too. Islam says Jesus existed, but he's not God. He was just a prophet of God. Why not? Because God is good. And God would not dirty himself by becoming a man. It's too dirty. Flesh is bad. Many people link Islam from the 5th century, 6th century, back to Gnosticism of Christianity. People who said God is good, but flesh is evil, therefore God could not become flesh. And what the apostles saw was not really flesh, it was an illusion. I remember what I said earlier, the debate about who Jesus is, is the longest running debate in the history of the church. Even today, who is Jesus? Is he all God? Is he all man? Is he all God and all man? If so, how do we explain that? It's inexplainable for a lot of us. We don't know all the intricacies of God being made flesh and still being God. Is Jesus subordinate to God? Does Jesus have to do what God the Father says? You know, he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. How does all that work? Is it because he's the Son, he has to do what the Father says? Is that the way it is? You know, uh, Irenaeus really had two points against the Gnostics. I'm about to close here. He said, look, first of all, there's only one God, and that God is good, and all that that God made is good. When God made the creation, he said it is good. When he made dirt and flesh and bones, he said it's good. Plus, he said the heavens declare the glory of God. And the second point in this book, really, as I'm summing it up, is that although the first Adam, the man, was evil, he did bring flesh and blood down. He sinned. Yeah, the first Adam sinned. He brought sin and death and corruption into the world. But God sent another Adam. He sent the second Adam, the last Adam. His name is Jesus, and he was good. And he was in the flesh. He was real. You could touch him. That's why John, in John's first letter, John says, that which we have seen with our own eyes and listened to with our own ears, and we have touched him. You can't touch an illusion. You can't touch a holograph. You can touch flesh and blood. That's why John said, Jesus was real, and he was good. And he's the last Adam. And as the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 5, through him, the one man Jesus, God's grace and gift of life came for the many. <clears throat> Irenaeus takes us to the, now the third century. And here's what we're finding out with all these guys. Is that this question keeps coming up. How am I going to defend who Jesus is to the people? Not just the people out there, but the people who are sitting in here. Early Gnostics and some Jewish Christians believed that he, he wasn't real. He was just an apparition. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was created, that God the Father created the angels, and that he's just like an angel. God created him. Therefore, he's a created being. Mormons believe, Mormons believe that Jesus was one of two sons that God the Father had. He had a good son, Jesus, and he had a bad son. Who's that? The devil or Lucifer. And these two are fighting for the souls of men. That's basically Mormonism. But listen, Justin believed that at the, at the end of every road of the search for truth was Jesus. 
Polycarp believed Jesus was a Savior who would never forsake us, never leave us, not even in the darkest of times. Irenaeus believed Jesus was the incarnation who gave everything for us. Here's the question for you. Who do you believe Jesus is? Now, I know what you're going to say. What I'm going to ask you is how you're going to live. If it costs you something. Are you going to shrink back and say, no, you know, if I, if I have to lose that or I can't do this or I can't say that and be a Christian, then I don't really believe Jesus is all that. That's the question of the ages. It's the question for you and for me today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for answering that question for us. I thank you, God, for telling us who Jesus is. I thank you, God, for giving us the faith to believe in him and to follow him. I pray, God, that you would bless each of us with that courage that when given that opportunity to toe the line, that we, like the apostles, that we, like Polycarp or Justin Martyr or Irenaeus or so many others, we would be willing to go down for our faith. Really, go down standing up. Lord, I don't know what's coming. We don't know what this world's going to look like in 50 years or 100, but our children and grandchildren and their children will perhaps still be around, and I pray they'll be holding the banner of Christ high. That's my prayer. That's why I'm living today, to pass that on to my kids, who will pass it on to their kids, who will pass it on to their kids, so that Jesus will never, ever be outside of our home our family, our churches, our nation, and our world. That's my prayer for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. If you're here today and you have a decision to make for Christ, I invite you to come. If you need to pray on your own, this platform stairs are ready for you. If you want Joel or I to pray with you over something, come as we sing and we'll do that.